Okay, so I'm going to go through this uh, first half of this DC machines. Uh, this will be the DC generators portion of it. Um, the second video I'll do for the motors. So we broke down your um, ILM quiz into these two sections as well too. So kind of just to keep it separate. So first thing I kind of want to review is basically theory on magnetism and electromagnetism. Um, because that's one of the fields that we have, our, sorry, our, well, magnetic field, but our actual field winding is created by an electromagnet. Okay, so we want to have an understanding of the difference between electromagnet and potentially permanent magnets, just so we can see that we can vary that electromagnet. So, again, either it's going to, our DC machine is either going to have a set of permanent magnets or electromagnets. Again, electromagnets we could actually manipulate or vary because we can change the amount of current flowing through it, which would change the, uh, the intensity of the field. Um, we're going to have an armature winding that is rotated, so that tells me it's on the rotor within the field, so the field is on the stator, again in a DC machine, by a mechanical prime mover. Okay, so whether that prime mover is a combustion engine, um, waterfall, wind turbine, okay, anything could be our prime mover, rotating that around in 360 degrees. Uh, commutator and brush set, again, that's how we're going to output DC to our load, okay? So a um, DC machine is going to need all three of these things. But to review some of the um, terms in, um, in regards to magnetism, they're going to talk about uh, our lines of flux, okay, and some units of measurement coming up in the next slide. So we do have our lines of flux that basically go from north to south, okay, and they're going to take the shortest path possible. Again, we have a lot more intensity within the core and just at the ends, okay, where it starts, and then it's going to dissipate as we get away from the, the magnet itself. Um, on this next slide here, saying they do not flow, but they are assumed to be oriented from the north to the south pole. They always form complete loops. They repel each other and never cross. So if you actually, you know, as you've pushed two, two like sides of a magnet, it's hard to push them together. They don't cross the lines, they actually bend. And what they want to do is go right back to their shortest uh, position. Um, so they, there is a force there that's going to try and push them back to the original place they were in. Um, again, they want to take the shortest path as possible. So if you distort that, it's going to try and go back. And they follow the path path of least reluctance. Okay? And reluctance, again, by definition, is the opposition to flux in a magnetic circuit. Okay, so they want low reluctance. That allows them to create a, a better magnetic field. So an air gap in a generator would have high reluctance, okay, because it's harder to, to, to make a, uh, have a magnetic field produced within air as opposed to like a steel magnetic core. Um, basic unit of measurement of, the mag of magnetic flux is a Weber. Um, again, it's a quantity of flux, it would be a very large number. Flux density describes the intensity of a magnetic field at any given point. So the symbol for flux density is the Greek letter beta or B, and the unit of flux density is the Tesla. So that's what it's measured in. Points closer to the poles of a magnet have higher flux density than uh, some from distance away. So again, flux density is the intensity at any given point. Well, the flux density would be greater here at this point than it would be out here, okay? So just a way to kind of remember that. Again, make sure you know the difference between these uh, so we don't get them confused. This is the one we're going to um, change with uh, our electromagnet with the amount of current that we have going through. Um, electromagnetism, again, this is where we actually create a magnet using electricity, okay? So... When we know when we, from our previous years, when we have current flowing through a conductor, there's a magnetic field that develops around that conductor. Okay, and when we talked in second year about coils, when we have a coil of wire, these just continue to amplify, 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 and create a better magnet or a larger magnet um, as we coil the wire. But we have to have an understanding that there is a magnetic field that develops around every conductor. Okay, and we talked about that in code even too with our sheath currents. So, they have this left-hand rule for conductors that's going to make it so that we can determine the direction of the magne magnetic lines of force, or if we knew that direction, we could find the direction of current. Basically, what it's going to do is your thumb of your left hand is going to point in the direction of current flow, and then your fingers are going to curl around the conductor in the direction of the magnetic lines of force. 
Okay, so this is uh, an example for that for our left hand rule for conductors. We kind of look at this as an arrowhead scenario. So this would be the tip of the arrow. So if the arrow's coming at you, you would treat your left thumb as the tip coming towards you. So pointing your left thumb towards yourself, you can see your hands curl around in the direction of these arrows. Okay, that's where your fingers curl around the conductor. That's showing you the direction of the magnetic um, lines of force there. Okay, then on this example, still using our left hand, this is like the tail of an arrow, so we would point our thumb into the screen as opposed to out of the screen towards us. So we're pointing it away from us into the screen, and we're able to see now that the lines of flux are direct, or the direction of them is opposite. Okay, so current flow is gonna dictate which way this magnetic field develops. So if we could change current flow, um, which we don't, it, well, we can in DC, but we would change the actual connection. It doesn't alter back and forth like AC. So once we have the uh, current flow, we've set up a basically a direction of, of magnetic lines of force that created a magnet that will not change. Once we know the North Pole, it's the North Pole, and the South Pole is the South Pole. Okay, So we can use this left-hand rule for conductors to help us uh, see that. Then we have the left-hand rule for polarity. And this would be in regards to setting up, again, creating an electromagnet. But how do I know then which end is the south and which end is the north? Okay, so that's what this is going to tell us. So if we take this electromagnet, okay, this coil now that we've created, again, we would use have a potentially have a metal core in there. They're showing just an air core here for uh, demonstration, I would say. So what we want to do is curl our hand over in the direction of current and then our thumb will point to the North Pole. Okay, so we would need to know the direction of current so that we could curl our left hand around it and then know that whichever side of the coil my thumb points to is the North and the other end would be the South. Okay, so if we had two coils um, to create a magnetic field in between them, we would do that for both, find out which one's the North, which one's the South, and um, we could create a, an electromagnet and know which way the field's going to develop by using the left-hand rule for polarity. Um, the coil flux density, so this is the coil, this coil here that we're talking about for a uh, creation of our electromagnet. So things that are gonna affect the strength of that field, so the flux density, is gonna depend on the current in the conductors. So again, this is a huge concept here. If we can vary the current going through the conductor of the coil, we can vary the amount of flux density. Okay? The number of turns and the core material. So again, if we want it to vary, this is going to be hard to do. We can't really affect the number of turns on the fly and we're not going to change the core material on the fly, but we can adjust the current. Okay. Whoops, sorry. These fact, uh, the factors that affect the density, how they affect the, the density, sorry, is the flux density increases as the coil, so this is the relationship, is it um, proportional or yeah, is it an inverse relationship? Basically, most of this stuff is, is proportional, so flux density increases as the current increases, so we put more current through there, we're going to get a stronger magnetic field or higher density. A coil with more turns is going to get stronger field than one with fewer. So more turns, more density. And for a given amount of current, an iron core results in greater flux density than air. Okay, again, a better gives us a better path for a magnetic field to develop. Um, the measure of a core's ability to produce flux is known as magnetomotive force, or MMF. So the amount of magnetic flux depends on, again, the turns in the coil. Um, and how much current we have going through it. Okay, so that's gonna that's gonna let us know how much MMF we have. So in uh, for a small kind of a math aspect to that MMF is basically if we have the amount of amps going through that wire, that conductor, and the number of turns, we can get a measurement of ampere turns for our, our value of MMF. So 10 turn coil carrying 50 amps produces 500 amps of MMF, ampere turns, okay? So it's just basically amps times turns. Um, we talked about this in all the years and generators too, but the core can only be magnetized to, a, to an extent. So we can add current to the conductor, which increases the flux density, and it's gonna increase and increase and increase and increase until it hits a point here 
we call the knee of this BH curve, B being the uh, flux density by the uh, MMF. So we're going to hit a point where that core is saturated. And even though we crank up the current on it, we're only going to see a small increment of flux density, okay, once it hits that knee. So it's not like we can just keep cranking up the opacity through the conductor and just keep continuing to build this better and better, larger and larger magnet. Okay, there is a limitation based on the core material. If we had a core of air, we would not see the saturation. We would basically see a linear straight line because the air would not saturate and it would not also be as, as good of a core as, as uh, iron or anything uh, metal. But the just so we know that, that um, it would not have this knee and would not saturate if it was an air core. Okay, and it does mention that in your module as well too. Um, basically, it says the cores, uh, coils with cores of air and other non-magnetic material show a different relationship between field intensity and flux density. Basically, non-magnetic core material inside of a coil would result in a straight line on a graph. So it'd be like a straight diagonal line across. Okay, without that saturation. Okay, then we talk about uh, the magnetic field itself. So where is it being developed? And what are the components um, of the electromagnetic circuit? So we would consider the pole pieces, so the pole core. So right here, this is where the field um, windings would be located. So the basically the coil around here, the conductor that we put current through to create a magnetic field. And then it would create this magnetic field throughout this, throughout the uh, frame, the yoke. And then here's would be our lines of flux between, and we have our armature um, on the rotor here rotating around. So um, make sure you uh, have an understanding of this uh, diagram, just because we will ask you questions on this too. Our pole shoe, again, different design here, larger than the core itself just to reduce the reluctance of the air gap. So it's it's a bit larger, tries to get as, as much, I guess, air gap removed uh, during, in this portion of the of the machine on both sides. And is, um, is again, very a lot larger than the actual um, pole core itself, okay? And that's where the field winding would be wrapped around. Um, so yeah, make sure you have an understanding of the uh, of the, the components of this machine and the magnetic circuit. Um, <clears throat> the next thing we talk about is the commutator section. Um, basically what, uh, what we want to uh, have with our DC machine is the ability to output that pulsating DC as opposed to alternating positive and negative alternations. Okay, and our split rings are gonna be able to help us achieve that. So commutator, again, is one of the most important parts, facilitates the collection of current from the armature conductor. So again, the armature windings are the ones that are rotating on the rotor, okay? And it's the connection point from the armature to the load. Okay, and that's again in a generator. If it was a DC motor, that's where we would connect the supply, okay, is to, to the brushes. Um, we'll stick to the uh, generator part of it. So we're going to be connecting a load to these brushes. So we would have a load connected here and here. And they make contact with the commutator section based on how many armature windings we have. Okay, some, it depends on the output voltage we want. We could have more or less, and that's going to help smooth out our output as well too, just like we talked about in the previous mod. Okay, but here's would be a commutator bar section. So our brushes would actually make contact here. And you can see this is the connection which goes and loops through the armature winding and comes back on, probably it would be on 180 degrees on the other side. Because our brushes are located on either side of that, uh, that section. And we'll see it in the next, next pick here. Um, so here's another section. So here we can see these are, are, would have less armature windings than this one. So here's very small sections, but that just tells us we have way, way, way more armature winding. So we would have a way smoother output out of this potential um, rotor design as opposed to the one previous because we have way more um, armature winding. So we don't get that deep valley before another armature winding would kind of be peaking and, and creating that smoother output for us. Okay, but just another design of a, of a commutator segment. 
And um, in general, we're going to talk about where the brushes are making contact with that in, uh, in these drawings here. It does uh, an all right job of, of showing us that. So some of the terminology we want to talk about, though, in, in this uh, for commutation is, the, um, is an area where the brushes need to be located. Okay, so when these brushes are making contact with the commutator segments, there's going to be voltage induced. So there's at a point, again, where we're at 90 and 270, where we're getting maximum voltage induced, and then we've got a point where the armature is parallel at 0 and 180, where we have zero voltages, uh, zero voltage induced at that time. That's where we want to have the, the brushes make contact with two segments. Okay, so two portions here. We're going to potentially be shorting it out. We want to do that at the at the point where there's zero voltage or the lowest possible voltage being generated. So what they refer to that as is the neutral plane. So the neutral plane runs perpendicular with the lines of uh, flux. So they're going from north to south across like this. Our neutral plane would be perpendicular and that's where when the armature winding is at zero again or 180 that's where we're going to have zero or the minimal amount of volts voltage induced in the armature at that time okay so again we want to use split rings to do that so that we when we hit this split it basically like starts the alternation again in the positive direction so we don't get that alternating current even though this is still spinning in a 360 degree um, circle or cycle, that split makes it so that we have pulsating DC as opposed to the full AC output. So split rings are, are essential. They are the whole reason that we can get pulsating DC out of a full rotating 360 degree armature. Okay, so uh, when the brushes are in the split ring, a split of the ring, the induced armature voltage will be its lowest value. So when the commutator segments are shorted, there's minimal arcing. So if we had them basically making contact where the voltage was peak, then we would have extremes amount, an extreme amount of arcing and potentially at the expense of our brushes um, being deteriorated. Obviously, arcing and sparking and heat is not our friend. Okay? It's at the uh, expense of our components for sure. So again, the brushes ideally would be located where they have the lowest value of induced voltage when the coil is parallel to the lines of flux it passes through the neutral plane. Okay, so again, when it's parallel or basically at zero and 180, where we're not inducing any voltage, we're gonna call that the uh, neutral plane. If we can do that, it's gonna reduce the amount of sparking and overheating of the brushes. Okay, so that's the intent is to have that location. So you can see as this right now, as this neutral plane, as the armature conductors are aligned with the neutral plane, they would be generating um, the lowest amount of voltage and then that's when we have the brushes making contact. So this picture here is just blown up right here. Okay, and showing that you were kind of shorting out those two segments at once with the brush location. Again, think this thing is spinning around uh, quite fast. Um, so this is a, a fraction of a second in time. So again, just to kind of blow it up here now. Now, when we have this armature as opposed to being vertical like this, we have it horizontal. This is where the armature uh, is basically at 90 and, and generating the highest amount of voltage. So we can see in this section here, that's where the brushes are making a nice uh, clean connection with just one segment at a time. Okay, so we won't have that arcing or sparking. So we're getting our load now is getting the maximum voltage um, at this point. And we can see the direction of current is going through here. Okay, so we continue through back up to, so now it starts out with the brown section, if you will, at zero, the white section at 180. Then we're at the brown section at 90. Now we'll continue the brown section of the armature down here is now at 270. But again, our brush is, that's where we're gonna make connection at the neutral plane, hit the split, and basically start our alternation over again. So we have zero volts here. That's where we want the brushes to be making um, connection is when we are generating zero volts. So when this is at zero and 180. Then on the next section, again, 270 now, um, we're seeing that we have full voltage, maximum voltage being induced, but again, we are not hitting the split. So we're getting full voltage to our load and the current direction is the same. 
Okay, so if we look back, the current direction is the same in both scenarios, even though we're flipping a 360 degree, because when it hits that split, it kind of just, like, again, think of it as starting an a positive alternation, starting all over again because of that split, okay? Now, we have some issues when we have our armature. Obviously, when we have a voltage being induced in the armature, now as it, we have the DC generator, it, we have voltage that's sitting there out of this DC generator that's waiting to be used. Now, once we hook a load up, to the armature. Again, that's going to be through the split ring commutation. So that's our brushes that are making connection there. The brushes are going to hook to the load. Okay, so here's our load here. If we have load, then we have current draw being drawn through here. Okay, now again, we talked about, well, when we have current going through a conductor, there's a magnetic field that develops around that current. So now we don't only just have the field winding that's creating our our electromagnet, okay, so we have that, that field in there, magnetic field, because of the current we're pushing through the field winding, that's DC current too. Now we have load current going through the armature as well. So now we have two magnetic fields that are kind of interacting with each other. The main winding or the field winding, our main field, and then we have our armature field that's being developed around our armature conductors because we have a load hooked up. Okay, so this current produces a magnetic flux in the armature. This means that in a generator under load, there are two sources of flux, okay, so two fields. The main field again, and then the armature flux produced by the current. So at no load, which means basically I don't have a load hooked up and that DC generator just running, uh, outputting voltage, just sitting there waiting, there, there is no armature flux, so there is no, there's only the one field, but as soon as we put load under it, now we're drawing current through the armature windings, we've created another, another uh, flux that's going to basically interact with the main, which um, will distort the main and potentially shift our neutral plane, okay? So the flux produced by the armature weakens or distorts the main flux, or the field flux, which affects the operation of the generator. The neutral plane shifts in the direction that the armature rotates. Commutation now takes place at a point where the armature coil being shorted out has voltage across it. So the whole point of having that neutral plane location with our brushes was to avoid the arcing. Well, now if we have armature reaction, it shifts the neutral plane. Hey, when there's some pictures coming up, I'll explain this. It shifts it, and now we actually have the contact being made outside of the... Uh, the point where there's zero volts being induced. So we do have arcing and sparking and heat. Okay, so we definitely don't, don't want that. So armature reaction is the distortion of the flux pattern in the machine caused by a cross-magnetizing effect of the armature flux. Okay, so kind of a, a lot of, a lot of <laughs> magnetic field talk, a lot of flux there, interaction with each other. So let's look at these pictures to kind of help us out here. So we have our neutral plane, again, perpendicular to the main field, okay? And again, there's current going through here. That's what we've used our, if it's not been told to us, that's how we find out that this is the north, this is the south. We use our left-hand rule for polarity. So we've now we can see that magnetic lines are going from north to south, okay, in a certain intensity, so a certain flux density here between the north and south pole. That's our main field flux, okay? So just in regards to this, they're gonna put that at zero just so we can kind of see how the interaction of these fluxes are, are gonna affect each other. So this would be under no load. Our neutral plane is nice and perpendicular. Okay, they do show current through here right now, but that's just because they wanna be able to show the effects. But technically, if the neutral plane is straight, we would say that that's under no load because it has not shifted due to armature reaction. Once we put current, into these conductors, we develop a magnetic field around the armature. Okay, so then we look at this next slide. So they've taken the field out, just so we can just look at the armature flux now. We have current being developed. So if we use our left-hand rule for conductors, we can point our thumb right out at us at the screen, and we can see that the lines of flux curl in a clockwise direction here. And here we're gonna point into the, into the screen and show that the lines of flux are developed in a counterclockwise way here. But what that shows is that the strength of the armature flux is coming right down this way, which is perpendicular to the main flux, or at a 90 degree from where the main flux was. So now we have a 
main flux or a field flux that was going horizontal across from north to south. And now we have this one that's basically 90 degrees opposing it, which then shifts the neutral plane. Okay, again, in the direction of the rotation of the armature. So now my main field isn't horizontal anymore, isn't perfectly horizontal. It's been shifted because of that armature reaction. So what it does is it shifts the neutral plane. Now if my brushes are located where the neutral plane originally was, now I have arcing and sparking and deterioration. So we can see that the resultant flux is basically would be the vectoral addition of the main field flux and the armature flux. And something of note that's important is that the neutral plane still is perpendicular with the resultant. But because the resultant is shifted now due to the armature reaction or current from a load being attached, now my neutral plane has shifted. Again, still perpendicular with the main field, but has shifted. Okay, so that's causing some problems. So again, the flux pattern in the generator is distorted as a result of the cross-magnetizing effects. The neutral plane is still 90 degrees to the resultant, but it has shifted. So the amount of the neutral plane shifts from no load is directly proportional to the load. So again, this neutral plane, it's in this position right now based on a load. If the load lessens, it goes back. If it increases, it gets worse, okay? And that all depends on the load. So if the load varies, the neutral plane will shift accordingly to, to the varying load. So some of the problems that we can see because of this, and then we'll talk about some of the solutions. So obviously the problem is that the neutral plane is shifting. So in the interpolar zone, that's the area between the poles of the machine, and the polar zone, we have issues. That's the area directly under the pole face. So first we'll talk about the interpolar zone. So the armature reaction causes a shift in the neutral plane, which forces commutation to take place in an area where there is voltage on the commutator segments when they're shorted. This causes arcing and heating, which will shorten the life of the brushes and commutator. Again, we don't want that. So how can we get rid of it? Well, one of the first things that would come to mind is, well, let's just move the brushes so that they're in line with the neutral plane. If we have a constant load or a fixed load, that would be fine. Okay, If we knew that the load was always the same, no matter what, we could shift those brushes and then it would be fine and we would have no issue. But if we have a load that varies, obviously that plane is neutral plane is shifting back and forth and moving around, so it's not practical. <clears throat> so uh, moving the, the brushes is, is the solution, but maybe not the best. The pole phase design of the main pole phase, so they can be designed to reduce the amount of flux in the interpolar zone, which again will reduce the effects of armature and reaction in that area. Most DC generators use pole phase uh, design that does reduce, but does not eliminate. Okay, so that's one way they will. They will design the pole faces to help uh, reduce that armature reaction. But probably one of the best uh, ways to help reduce it is by adding interpoles with commutating windings to the generator. So these poles are narrow poles placed directly in line with the no load neutral plane. So no load, again, basically perpendicular with the main field, okay? And there's a picture coming up here, I'll help explain this. Um, the interpoles are wound with windings called commutating windings, and the polarity of the interpole must be such that it opposes a flux in, uh, or sort of it produces a flux in direct opposition as the armature. Okay, so we want to oppose it. So again, we saw here that the armature flux is coming basically down this way at a straight perpendicular line with the main field. So if we go back to now these interpoles, so here's the interpoles here. And again, they said it was in a line with the no load neutral plane, which would be basically perpendicular to that field, main field flux. But the big thing is, is that we have to wire it and basically send current through so that this field that's created by the interpoles, you can see it's moving up here. It's going directly opposite that of the armature field, okay? So this armature field being developed by the current going through it, we're basically gonna create a opposing magnetic field that basically is gonna cancel out this armature. So we need our interpole field to be the 180 degree complete opposite direction so that it cancels out the armature flux. So that comes into mind then, well, how are we going to get the same magnitude to try and, and cancel out this armature flux? Well, the armature flux is being created by the load, OK? 
Okay, the current going through the windings based on the load. So that's creating the magnitude or the intensity of this flux. So if we could hook up the inner pole to the same current, it would have the same magnitude and would directly cancel out the armature flux. So when we hook up the inner pole, uh, again, commutating winding, it, we would hook it up in series with the armature because we know from, from series connections that the current that goes through the armature is going to be the same current that goes through the interpol or commutating winding. So we hook these up in series, then the magnitude of the armature flux and the interpol winding are the exact same, and they would virtually cancel each other out. Okay, so again, directly proportional to armature current, so the action of the interpoles must be proportional to armature current as well. That's why they're hooked in series. Okay, uh, since it has to carry the armature current, the commutating windings are made of heavy gauge conductor with few turns. Okay, again, large, large current going through there based on the connected load too. Again, interpoles are so effective in eliminating the effects of armature reaction in the interpolar zone that the neutral plane becomes virtually fixed in the no load position regardless of load. Okay, so by adding these interpole uh, with commutating windings, we're basically mitigating or canceling out this whole um, flux here with this interpole flux and we're right back to sorry this point here where our main field now is not being distorted even though there's current flowing through here because we don't get this distortion because these this interpole uh, magnetic field is directly canceling out this uh, field from the armature okay again same current going through so same intensity gonna cancel it out ideally completely Okay, the other thing they talk about for armature reaction, how to mitigate it, is in the polar zone. So that's the area right under the pole faces. Okay, so they're talking about it right here on the pole face themselves. So the cross magnetizing effect of armature reaction may cause trouble in DC machines subject to large fluctuations in load. In order to neutralize a cross magnetizing effect, a compensating winding is used. Okay, so difference between the two, commutating here on the interpole compensating in the pole face. Okay? Compensating windings consist of a series of coils embedded in the slots of the pole face. These coils are connected in series, again in series with the armature to get the same current flowing through them. The series connected compensating windings produce a magnetic field which varies directly with the current, again because they're hooked in series with the armature. Because the compensating windings are wound to produce a field that opposes the magnetic field of the armature, they tend to cancel out the cross magnetizing effects of the armature magnetic field. So basically we're just adding these windings in at 180 degrees with the armature to cancel out any effects that it has due to the fact that it's drawing current through the windings and creating magnetic fields around them. Okay, so by using commutating windings and interpoles and compensating windings and designing that pole face, we can basically eliminate the effects of armature reaction. Okay, so again, showing them both hooked in series so that they're seeing the same current in order to cancel out the effects. Okay, but would be wired in a, in a north and pole way to basically cancel out the effects. So even though they're seeing the same current, they are, are wound completely opposite to the armature winding so that they oppose that magnetic field that's being created by the armature. Okay, um, again, so they're connected in series, just like the commutating. Commutating windings are not common and, nor and are normally seen on motors larger than 100 horsepower. Okay, so the interpole with the uh, commutating is definitely gonna be the most common thing you're gonna see. The use of commutating and compensating windings virtually eliminate the effects of armature reaction. And even under varying loads. Okay, so that's uh, how we can deal with that. We want to maintain that main field flux as straight as possible so we can eliminate the arcing and sparking on our brushes. Okay, so that's uh, DC generators. Uh, that's the first objective in your module. So I'll stop there. You